Hey, what's going on, good people? It's Gardner Douglas, your Oyster Ninja. I'm here today with Miss Deanna Levitt. Levitt. Not leave it. We're going <laughs> to love it. Uh, she is uh, representing, and you're like, it's like your family business, right, of uh, Caviar Star? Yes. So our company is called Great Atlantic Trading, but our main brand that has been around for a while is Caviar Star. And it was um, started by my parents, Dana and Denise. And me and my brother Derek, <laughs> um, we all work for the family business. So, all D's. That's that's wonderful. So, how in the world does one come into like, let's start a caviar business? Let's do that. Um. Well, it's not what they intended when they started out. Um, my parents are actually living. We're all from Portland, Maine originally. All of my ancestors have been there since forever. Um, so they were trying to put themselves through college in Portland, Maine, and they had a lobster catering business that they started up and eventually sold. So I guess that was kind of the entrance into seafood. And then my dad had a good friend who was a scallop diver. So he started diving for scallops. And eventually he met a Japanese man who wanted him to start diving for umi, sea urchin row. And that just kind of snowballed into caviar by him asking if we could source American caviar for export to Japan. So that's how I got into caviar. And as their business progressed, they did, you know, all types of fish processing out of um, Portland, Maine. But then they started focusing more heavily on caviar because they realized they loved it. And they love the um, fancy gourmet side of things too. So they started going into imported Italian, French, and Spanish extra virgin olive oils, truffle products, things like that. So now you just said something that's really um, been baffling me for a while because you know I've been working for the restaurants and different things. What in the world is truffles? <laughs> so truffles are a tuber. They're in the mushroom family. And they actually grow underground. Um, historically, they were hunted using hogs. Um, oh, wow. But now they use dogs because dogs don't want to eat them as much as a hog does. And I'm sure wrestling like a 300-pound hog for a truffle might be a little difficult. <laughs> you might lose the fingers. So, um, yeah, truffles are really unique. They're one of the most expensive food in the world. Um, white truffles are. And they're delicious. They're definitely... Uh, a unique flavor that you won't really taste anywhere else. And when I was a kid, I hated the smell. So we had a truffle room, um, but now I'm obsessed. Like my gateway into truffles was truffle salt. And now I want truffle on everything. <laughs> it's so okay. good. I remember that truffle salt. So I'm writing that. Yeah, we'll thing. have to get you some truffle products. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's really interesting. So, um, and just to stay with the truffles for a little bit longer. Um, so like there's truffles and caviar, does that pair together? Or is it just two separate entities? Um, a lot more recently, I've been seeing people shave truffles onto caviar dishes. So they're two very different strong flavors, but I have seen them together. Just probably like a, you know, cream of the crop foods. Like what can you have that's more expensive than caviar? Throw some truffles on it. <laughs> right, right. All right, so let's let's go to the bread and butter, which is uh, caviar. Um, so what is caviar? And it, is it, well, I'll let you answer first. So not all, mm, this is the quote that I like to say. Okay. So all caviar is roe, but not all roe is caviar. So roe is going to be eggs that are coming from a marine mammal. Um, and even things like, we have escargot roe. That's not a marine animal. That's a land animal, but people still call it roe because it looks a lot like caviar, but I digress. Um, caviar, true caviar has to come from a sturgeon. Hold so on. Let, let's, di <laughs> let's, let's not digress. What escargot from a land animal? What is that going on? Um, so that's a new product. We probably picked up oh, over a year ago, uh, maybe more now, probably two years ago. And we call it white caviar but it's literally snail eggs. So coming Ooh. from escargot, it's very earthy. Um, it's about the size of a trout egg and it's milky white. It's really, really pretty. And a lot of chefs have been using it. I mean, even desserts for like an earthy flavor. Um, I've seen it on steaks. It's, it's really unique. Um, I like it, but I like earthy mushroomy flavors and I'm a caviar person. So 
Um, yeah, snail roe is really weird. Um, it's really unique. They're just similar to sturgeons in the way that they can reabsorb their eggs if they're not happy. So you have to keep the snails really happy for them to lay eggs. Um, can take up to 100 days, I believe, for the snails to produce the eggs, and then over two days for a snail to lay the eggs because they're really sn slow, you know. Right. Um, and then the producers go in and they hand pick every single egg out of the little dirt pods where they lay them, and then they wash them in a salty brine. And yeah, that's escargot caviar. Get the heck out of here. What in the world? <laughs> I know so many weird foods out there, right? Wow, and I was gonna ask you about the um, the snail eggs anyway, because I saw it on the website and I, I had never heard of it, but I guess I have heard of it because escargot. Mm -hmm. But um, so um, you talked about keeping the uh, snails happy, the fish happy. So what's, what is like the, what is the harvesting process like? So harvesting for caviar, um, it's a long process. Uh, it obviously depends if it's wild caught or farm raised. Um, where it's farm raised, they're going to be doing biopsies and ultrasounds to make sure they're ready for harvest. Whereas if they're you know wild caught, they're just harvested. Um, harvesting, unfortunately, I wish that sturgeons didn't have to be killed for caviar, but you know, over, I'd say 95%, maybe even over 98% of all caviar is harvested using the kill method. And um, that's just because what they've tried to do with non-kill methods, um, milking, vivace method, Kohler process, these are all terms for non-kill caviar harvesting. And essentially they have to inject a pregnancy inducing hormone, I mean, um, yeah, so they have to inject a hormone that it essentially will induce labor, I meant, and then um, they milk the eggs out. It's called stripping. And um, it's used for, I would say, probably salmonoid fishes, like trouts more often than um, sturgeon. But the problem with it is the one, if a pregnant woman is going to be eating something that was injected with a labor-inducing hormone, that might not be good. And then two, the quality of the caviar is just not the same. So the texture isn't to the level of, you know, good quality caviar that you'd want to eat. So people that I know that have tried milked or Kohler processed caviar, um, it's just not, not to the bar that it needs to be. So unfortunately, most, cav most surgeons have to be killed to process the caviar. But, okay. you know, science is always evolving, so maybe they'll figure out the kinks going forward. And there's many, many more farms than I've ever been in the past decade. So that also adds to the abundance of caviar in the market. Um, we could go down so many roads with this, okay. so I'll just let you ask the questions. That, that's really interesting, though. Like, I didn't, you know, I, so that's the biggest difference between um, farm and wild, I guess. Um, other differences would be, you know, flavor profiles. When it's being farmed, the producer has a lot more control over the quality and the outcome of the caviar. And when it's farmed, it's, you know, the environment does its thing and you get what you get. And sometimes that creates a lot more natural or earthy um, flavor that a lot of people, classic caviar aficionados love. Um, I would say a good thing to think about would be like American hackleback. Um, it's a fast growing sturgeon. It is caught in the Mississippi River and it is not that expensive even though it's a real sturgeon because one, you didn't have to do the investment of farming it and two, it is a fast um, growing sturgeon. So it only takes a couple years to produce eggs as opposed to an Ocetra that can take over 10 years or a white sturgeon, like out in California, they'll take at least seven years to um, reach maturity of eggs. So the, the cetra, is that like one of the longest? Uh, the Sorry, my dog's drinking water. <laughs> oh, that's what it was, okay. <clears throat> it's all good. Um, so the, the, the cetra, is that like the, the longest, um, I guess, period? It's like 10 um, years? Oh, cetra and beluga, yeah, oh, over 10 years and, um, or up to 10 years, over 10 years. Sometimes they do a second maturation of eggs too, which can add another year or so. 
um, because they want to make sure the eggs are nice size and the first time around that they'll create eggs it's you know they're smaller so they let them lay those eggs and then recreate a next batch and then they'll harvest those so yeah it's a it's a big investment there's a lot behind it i'm not a caviar farmer so mm -hmm. i'm not an expert on that but i have been lucky enough to visit um quite a few caviar farms and see how they do it so it's really interesting i love right. anything to do with biology so wow so yeah did you um get any degrees or anything to help you out with just uh or has it just been like in the family so much you just learned it along the way uh I wish I got a caviar degree, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> or like some kind of like marine biology degree. Right. Um, no, I actually, you know, literally grew up in caviar. I was stickering lids when I was five and then packing caviar and I was like eight or nine. So I just grew up around caviar. I took it for granted, you know, as a kid. And now that I'm older, I appreciate it a lot more. Nice. Um, but no, it's just been, you know, our family business so even when we're not at work we're sometimes talking about caviar and yeah. i've just absorbed a lot as i went and um it's just i love fine food and fine dining and anything gourmet and so it's just fun to learn more about it good lifestyle to be in yeah i'm very fortunate <laughs> i mean not many people can say that they've grown up around caviar right so, so um what well no first of all uh so are some caviars, I guess, illegal to come in the States or how does that, what is going on with that? So since 2005, um, Fish and Wildlife banned any huso species. So beluga is huso huso. And that is like the top, if you ever hear expensive caviar, you hear beluga. And if it gets any more expensive than beluga, it's usually almas, which is albino beluga. And that mm. can go for, you know, five times the price, 10 times the price, whatever the producer wants to charge really because it's so rare. Right. Um, but as for illegality in the US, the US was one of the main consumers of beluga. So um, once it became critically endangered, Fish and Wildlife outlawed any import of beluga to the US. So that's been since 2005 and that also includes any other huso species, which would be huso darkus, which is a kaluga. So you'll see on our website, we sell Beluga hybrid and Kaluga hybrid. And this is legal because hybrid species, any hybrid sturgeon species in the US is legal. It just can't be pure Beluga or Kaluga. Got you. And um, that's interesting. So you talked about it a little bit, but what really um, gets the price? Like how is price of caviar determined? So price all correlates to um, a few factors, one being rarity, um, you know, many foods, if it's more rare, it's going to be more expensive, like many products out there in the world. Um, but yeah, rarity, the grade of the caviar, the species, so some species, like I said, etc., they take a lot longer to produce eggs. Um, so that longer investment by the farmer is going to cause the price to substantially increase. Um, so yeah, it's rarity, it's the grade of the caviar, um, whether it was wild caught or farm raised. And then obviously if it's a true sturgeon, it's a lot more expensive. That's why, um, sometimes people get confused with paddlefish because it looks just like sturgeon caviar, but a paddlefish is actually a cousin of the sturgeon and, um, it's technically roe because it's not from a sturgeon, but it looks, it's dark, it's gray, it's green, it's brown, it's black. So it looks right. like sturgeon caviar. No doubt. But it's much cheaper because it's not. Got you. So, um, like, let's say, you know, I, I buy some um, caviar. Um, first of all, um, what, what are some, like, popular ways to eat it? And then what is the shelf life of it? Okay. So, popular ways to eat it, I'd say the most popular would be, um, or the most classic would be with bellinis and creme fraiche. And bellinis are just little mini French pancakes um, that don't have, you know, they're not sweet. They're just bland pancakes. And you put creme fraiche on there, which is French style cultured cream. And then the classic accompaniments are always chopped onions or green onions and then um, hard boiled eggs. And you usually separate the egg whites from the egg yolks. So that's the classic way to serve it. Uh, 
I like just eating it straight up. <laughs> I know a lot of people do that. Um, my favorite way to pair it with anything though is I love Ocetra personally and I love Siberian because they're creamy species. They have really creamy notes and they're buttery. Um, so I actually get a, a French baguette, I cut it into toast points, put a little good quality butter on there and then put the caviar straight on top. Either with champagne or vodka, that's my favorite way. Nice. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see, oysters, of, of course. course. Right. <laughs> I see so many more um, caviar companies now and a lot of new caviar brands teaming up with oyster companies. So that's a perfect way to eat it. I know a lot of people do sturgeon caviar and oysters. And then also um, I've seen a lot of customers love our smoked trout for oysters. I know you tried that. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, I like the, um, it was a smoke I liked, and uh, uh, I think trout and salmon, mm -hmm. and um, I think the hackleback I like. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a couple more, but it's all good. It's, it's you mm -hmm. know, it's just you know, whatever tickles your fancy, I guess. Yeah, so once you get the taste for caviar, then exactly. you can kind of start exploring all the different flavor profiles. Yeah. Um, it's all depends on your taste, obviously. I mean, we have people who consistently just love hackleback because it's small grain, black, it's, you know, affordable, and they can eat mass quantities of it and pair it with things, and there's not a lot of overpowering flavor. Exactly. Um, and then there are some caviars that have a lot of flavor. Um, Beluga's typically, you know, creamy, rich, a little salty. Um, and speaking of salt, I just want to mention that all sturgeon caviar should have malasol salt, which is just a classic term for low salt, and it should be around 3%. I wouldn't, malasol shouldn't go over 4%. Um, you can tell a big difference if it goes over 4% salt, like the cheap caviars, like lump fish, well, cheap rose, I should say, not coming from a sturgeon, they will put up to 8% salt in them, and um, you can definitely taste it it's a preservative obviously so right so i guess that that kind of runs into the uh the shelf life mm -hmm. so like on a regular let's say uh low salt uh three percent and under i guess uh what's the shelf life of caviar so shelf life um in an ot which is what we receive most caviar in it's the original tin um it's about yay big by this tall mm -hmm. and it um it's aged actually sometimes which they say aging it's going to be you know a few months being in the cooler at optimum temperature um and it's going to be flipped so it keeps the juices flowing the salt going through all the eggs so some people will age their caviar and it's going to uh, develop a stronger flavor I like a good, you know, a fresh, not too aged caviar because I like it with less of a strong flavor. And then also sometimes caviar can absorb the metallic taste of the tin. So sometimes when we notice that that's happening, you know, you'll have to not use some of the caviar around the edge of the tin and go for what's in the middle. So there's a lot to, you know, making sure that from fish to jar, it's the best quality. There's a right. lot of factors that go into it. But as for shelf life, I'd say for the average consumer, whenever you receive a jar or a tin of caviar unopened, it will last um, between 27 and definitely below 37 degrees Fahrenheit is optimum temperature, but it'll last, you know, three, three weeks to a month um, unopened. And then when it is opened, I would suggest consuming it within three, three to five days. Some okay. people say up to a week. I've had it depends on the salt content, you know. Um, depends if it's a tin and you're able to shut it airtight, or um, if there's air in the container. That'll also make it go bad a lot faster. Got you. So um, with the salt content, uh, is there any health benefits um, eating caviar? There are a lot of health benefits. I'd say the only um, downside to eating caviar would be salt consumption if you're watching out for how much sodium you're taking in. And your pockets. Um, Don't forget your pockets. Yeah, and uh, how much money you're <laughs> in. Um, so let's see. I wanted to talk real quick too about um, just other things that you can do with caviar. 
Okay. Um, just before we get off that topic, but I mentioned hard boiled eggs, straight up, toast points, bellinis, oysters, of course. Um, but I've also seen, you know, sushi is a common accompaniment with caviar, especially flying fish roe, which is tobiko. Um, but I see a lot more sturgeon caviar in sushi these days. And then avocado toast, you know, that was a big trend. I'm now seeing a lot of caviar avocado toast, um, lobster rolls, crab rolls. It's amazing on those. Um, and then in bisques, pasta, pastas, everything you can think of. I've even seen it in a burrito. So okay. <laughs> possibilities are endless for caviar these days. Right. No doubt. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm gonna get back to your other question. The other question was the health benefits. Yeah, health benefits. So if you're watching out for your salt, I mean, I would only worry about it if you're consuming a lot of caviar because it's really, you know, 3% salt isn't that much. Mm -hmm. But let me get to my daily percentages here because I don't know this off the top of my head. Um, so it says the average serving of caviar is about one tablespoon. For me, it would be probably an ounce, <laughs> so a lot more than a tablespoon. Right. Um, it has over 400 milligrams of EPA, omega-3, so essential healthy fats, um, over 600 milligrams of DHA, so that's your other omega-3, um, common in fish oils, essential for brain development, is linked to improved heart health, vision, and cholesterol. Um, about four grams of protein per serving, less than one carb, less than 50 calories, over 133% of your daily vitamin B12. Um, so that will support a strong metabolism and heart health as well. And then about 79 milligrams, so 18% of your daily target of choline, which supports healthy fat and cholesterol transport throughout your body. Um, there's also about 48 milligrams, which is 15% of your daily target of magnesium, and then about 10 micrograms of selenium, so 19% of your daily intake. So wow. a lot of health benefits. Um, it's now some new brands are selling it as a health superfood. So it's no longer just an exclusive, expensive, rare food. It's being touted as a superfood because it is. It's really good for you. And I honestly... I was looking on your site and caviar can be affordable. I mean, mm -hmm. well, you know, caviar and roe, you know, but I mean, it's all good. And, you know, if you want to jazz up a party or jazz up a, a dinner date or whatever, you know, you can find something affordable. Yeah. So caviar price, you'll notice if you're shopping around, it can be all over the place. Right. Even if it's for the same species, just based on what brand you're buying from, what produ producer. Um, for our company, we, like I said, started out as my parents were fishmongers um, and we went into the distribution route. So, you know, that's going to be lower prices. We weren't doing retail prices. And as demand increased, our customer bases increased, um, we started our online store. And, you know, caviar is a lot more abundant than it was even 10 years ago because of the increase in the number of farms and the interest in it around the world. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a lot more common and, um, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I get hung up on it. Um, so you were talking about the prices and, um, you know, how common it is and, uh, you know, how prices can be up and down and all over the place. Yes. yes I digressed. Um, so the pricing, other companies out there, sometimes, you know, you can mark it up to essentially whatever somebody will buy it for. But for us, it's just been, you know, distributor wholesale focused and we don't mark it up to ridiculous rates. But that also sometimes I feel like degradates our brand because people see that our prices are so low, but it's not because the quality is compromised. We actually sell to a lot of other brands out there who charge a lot more. Um, uh, that's the same caviar a lot of the time. Uh, we move. I gotta things. give me some oyster ninja caviar. Go ahead and put the ninja. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you should do your own oyster ninja label. Yeah, cool. no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, just talking about our prices, caviar price can be all over the all over the place. It blows my mind when some of our customers 
sell the same caviar we're selling at an outrageous price, but you see some people really care about buying from a brand um, that they can trust. And, you know, we're a brand that you can trust, but when you're just shopping around and you don't know much about caviar, sometimes right. you see the most expensive thing and you think it's the best thing. So that was you, honestly one of my questions, like, you know, just because it's the highest price, does that mean it's the best? But I think you just answered it um, clearly. Yeah, it can be a bit ambiguous. And that's why some people have a hard time um, figuring out caviar because historically it has been amb ambiguous. There's not a lot of information out there to help you, um, you know, guide you through the purchasing process. So I think we've been a good resource for a lot of people with our blog. Um, we're very transparent and open about the caviar industry. Um, you know, there have been other companies historically who have gotten in trouble for mislabeling and, you know, being ambiguous with their species names. So mm -hmm. a lot of people come to us just because they know that, you know, we're a family business. We're really transparent and honest. Our prices are really honest. And, you know, my parents have been doing this for almost 30 years. So we have all the connections. We move a lot of volume. Um, so that's why we're able to have low prices as well. And, we're just not, we're not trying to jack up the prices super high. Um, just the way that our company is set up. And we want more people to be able to enjoy caviar since it is really good for you. And there's a lot more of it now, like I said earlier. Um, so we don't want any of it to go to waste. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Caviar Star. Um, so how, how has COVID, like this COVID-19 affected the business or has it? Um, you know, like most businesses, when it hit, it was really scary, uh, especially, you know, selling direct to restaurants or selling to distributors who sell direct to restaurants. As you know, a lot of restaurants shut down. Um, so it was a bit scary. I'd say our distribution um, slowed down a lot. But thankfully, we had our wonderful customers who were cooking up a storm at home right. and buying um, some of our retail items. So caviar, like I said, we sell... Um, some of the best extra virgin olive oils in the world. Actually, Il Castellare, which is one of our olive oils, was um, it was on CBS or one of those news stations for the, they did a, a search for the purest olive oil in the world. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden overnight, like our Il Castellare sales were going through the roof and we're like, what's going on? Barely right. everyone had seen that. So That's not we saw a lot of, yeah, a lot of good culinary products that people wanted to use when they were cooking at home, finding their chef hat, and um, that helped keep us going. Um, as for our employees and everything, we furloughed everyone as soon as it hit. We wanted to make sure that everyone would be safe, and um, we actually considered a micro business. We normally have under 10 employees, except over um, the holiday season when we have to bring in seasonal employees to help with the Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's rush. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we also are a food processing facility. So we already had masks. We wear lab coats. We wear gloves. Um, now we just enforce masks throughout the whole building at all times, social distancing. And then we don't let outsiders come in the building. So even couriers, um, if you're, you know, FedEx driver coming, you need to wear a mask too or stay out. So we're very strict about that, but thankfully, um, you know, we already had a lot, a lot of hygiene and um, mask wearing, glove wearing protocols in place. So yeah, we've adjusted well, I think. And our main employees are back and, um, you know, distribution is picking up a bit. So that's good. I'm hoping that all these restaurants are going to open up and stay afloat. It's wonderful. Yeah. What about you? Tell me uh, about you. How have you been surviving COVID? You see it. Shut racism. <laughs> I've been coming Shut up it. with <laughs> yeah, I've been coming up with t-shirts. I've been delivering oysters instead of, you know, my normal catering stuff. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of YouTube videos. Um like this are going to YouTube, the audio going to podcast. So I've just been keeping busy and just coming up with other ways to make it happen, honestly. Nice. Yeah. Good, Good for you. Well, so, I can't wait to get my shirt. No doubt. Did you already order it? Yeah. Oh, look at you. Which, which shirt did you get? You. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oops. 
Of course you did. I knew that. <laughs> it I was from that. my other account, so you probably got confused. That's what it was. That's what it was. Man, I, I'm slipping. I'm slipping. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll put a little something extra in your bag, too. Oh. Thanks for uh, Send me an oyster out. shell. <laughs> That's catchy. That's little catchy. little caviar serving dish. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So where can the good people find you guys and the website and the social media and, you know, anything else you want to add? Um, so we are caviarstar.com. Um, you can buy our, you know, our culinary products on there and our caviar, obviously. Um, caviar.star on Instagram. I'm running an Instagram. I'm not the best at social media, so I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Um, yeah, and then I just tie that to our Facebook. So Caviar Star on Facebook or Great Atlantic Trading, like I said, is our um, company name. But we have a few other exciting things in the works that unfortunately I can't talk about yet. But I'll keep you posted. All right, cool. And I'll keep the, po the people posted so we can uh, right. help out, do what we got to do. Cool. Let's see. Were there any other things that we didn't touch? Harvesting, yeah. I think we, I answered all the questions, I think. You did a great job. You did a great job. I want to say thank you for uh, taking time out to come on the Oyster Ninja podcast. Oh, thank and, you uh, for having me. Yeah, I of appreciate course. reaching because it was out. So, and... It was so interesting when you came to uh, JJ McDonald, you and your brother, and did the class. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got to get them on. It took a little longer, but hey, we got you. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you did this, and sorry for my brain fart there in the middle, but... <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. It's been a long day. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on.